The great locomotive chase occurred over 133 years ago, but it will long be remembered as one of the great events of the Civil War. It was brought to worldwide prominence by Walt Disney Productions in their 1950s movie titled The Great Locomotive Chase. A lesser known version of The Chase was produced in 1926 and starred Buster Keaton. Many books have also been written about The Chase. This edition of Crossroads will be to highlight the importance of Bartow County to its outcome. No other county can claim equal activity involving people, action, number of stops, rolling stock and track distance covered. A close examination of the 43 miles of track across this county will lead to the conclusion that Bartow County is where the heart of events took place. However, this edition would not be complete without a pre-Civil War history of the railroad in Georgia and more importantly, a pre-Civil War history of the railroad in Bartow County, formerly Cass. The first passenger railroad train in the United States ran in 1830 between what is now Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. The first railroad in Georgia began its operation from Augusta westward in 1837. By 1839, the Georgia Railroad, as it was called, was extended to Greensboro and only a year later to Madison, with a branch to Athens. The year 1842 saw the completion of the Central Railroad from Savannah to Macon. The Monroe Railroad, chartered in 1833, was complete from Macon to Forsyth in 1838. While these railroads were being built, another railroad was chartered in 1836, which would have a great impact on our county. This railroad was to extend through the Cherokee Territory of North Georgia to the Tennessee River, connecting the Atlantic seaboard with western transportation markets. It was to be built at the expense of the state of Georgia and be called the Western and Atlantic Railroad in honor of the project's purpose. A location seven miles east of the Chattahoochee River was selected as a point where this new railroad would begin and the two railroads from the south would end. By 1845, the Georgia Railroad, originating in Augusta, was completed to a point in the small community of Whitehall which boasted a small post office. The community was later called Terminus and then Marthasville in honor of former Governor Wilson Lumpkin's daughter. Not long afterwards, this point on the southern end of the Western and Atlantic was given the permanent name of Atlanta. Construction of the Western and Atlantic Railroad was completed in 1851, with Cass County possessing the greatest track distance of any Georgia county. Meanwhile, the Monroe Railroad, renamed the Macon and Western Railroad, reached Atlanta in 1846. To secure connections with Montgomery and regions to the west, the Atlanta and West Point Railroad was completed in 1853. In December 1849, the Memphis Branch Railroad from Kingston to Rome was open for business, making Kingston an important distribution point, being on the new Western and Atlantic Railroad and now being connected by rail to the river boats traveling the Coosa River. When the Civil War began on April 12, 1861, the Western and Atlantic Railroad became of vital importance to the Confederacy for the transportation of men and material from this vast region. Chattanooga, on the northern end of the Western and Atlantic, connected with railroads from Nashville, Louisville, and the Midwest. Atlanta, on the southern end, connected to Augusta, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, Montgomery, Mobile, and New Orleans. With the completion of a railroad from Dalton to Knoxville in 1855, the Western and Atlantic connected with East Tennessee and Virginia as far north as Richmond. One can understand why Union General Ormsby McKnight Mitchell met with James J. Andrews, a contraband merchant and a spy, on the evening of April 6, 1862 near Shelbyville, Tennessee. A plan was devised to destroy the bridges along the Western and Atlantic Railroad, putting the line out of commission, thus isolating Chattanooga from its supply routes to the south. General Mitchell felt he could then move southeast and seize Huntsville, Alabama, then move east against Chattanooga. On April 7, 1862, 22 volunteers were selected from the troop of Colonel Joshua W. Sills' Ohio Brigade, plus a civilian William Campbell. The group met with James Andrews later that night and were told to be in Marietta, Georgia by midnight April 10th. However, the date was later changed to the 11th due to bad weather. Concurrently, General Mitchell's force would move on Huntsville. The move on Chattanooga would begin upon word of the successful completion of the mission.
The volunteers separated into small numbers and were to travel over land a distance of over 100 miles. By twos and threes, they made their way first to Chattanooga. If questioned, the volunteers were to advise they were en route from Fleming County, Kentucky to Chattanooga with hopes of finding and joining a Kentucky-raised Confederate regiment. At 5 p.m. on Friday, April 11th, most of the Raiders departed Chattanooga on the southbound passenger train over the Western and Atlantic Railroad, reaching Marietta around midnight. Two of the group did not reach Marietta at all, having been forced to enlist in the Confederate Army near Jasper, Tennessee. Most of the men that night stayed in a hotel then known as the Fletcher House, which we know today as the Kennesaw House, located on the square in downtown Marietta, facing the railroad. The remaining Raiders stayed at another hotel. All were briefed by Andrews on the events that were about to unfold the following morning. At 4 a.m. Saturday, April 12th, the locomotive general was being removed from the car shed in Atlanta in preparation for its trip to Chattanooga that day. Attached to the general were the tender, followed by three empty box cars, a baggage car, and two passenger cars. Jeff Kane was at the throttle that morning, Andrew J. Anderson was the fireman, and the conductor who was to figure so prominently in the adventure was William A. Fuller. Riding as a passenger was Anthony Murphy, foreman of Motive Power and Machinery for the Western and Atlantic Railroad, who was on his way to Alatoona to check on a water pump. The train's first stop was Marietta, where Andrews and his raiders boarded the train, showing tickets to various stations up the line. Only Raider John Porter and Martin Hawkins failed to be aboard, having failed to awaken on time. Get seats near each other in the same car and, of course, say nothing of our business on the way up. When the train makes the big shanty breakfast stop, keep your places till I tell you to go. If anything unexpected happens, look to me for the lead. Knight, Brown, and Wilson will go with me on the engine. The rest will go on the left of the train, forward of where we'll uncouple it. Climb into the cars as fast as you can when the order is given. If anyone interferes, shoot him, but don't fire unless you have to. James Andrews. At around 6 a.m., the train pulled into the Big Shanty Station. Visible to the west was Camp McDonald, a military instruction camp recently established. Most of the passengers, including the conductor, engineer, and fireman, left the train, walking over to the Lacey Hotel, which was built by the Western and Atlantic Railroad during the mid-1850s. The old hotel was later burned by the Union Army in November 1864. Big Shanty is now called Kennesaw. It was a suspenseful moment for us when the conductor called out, Big Shanty, 20 minutes for breakfast. We could see the tents of rebel troops and guards slowly pacing their beats. Now was our opportunity, yet for a moment we were compelled to keep our seats and wait for the signal of our leader. We did not know how long during the 20 minute stop Andrews would wait. If anything could be gained by waiting five or 10 minutes, we were sure that he, with his marvelous coolness, would wait and expect us to do the same. But Andrews meant no delay. He quietly rose and without turning his head towards us, stepped to the door with the crowd that was pouring out. Our engineer, William Knight, whether from natural impulsiveness or at a signal from Andrews, rose also and went out with him. Corporal William Pittinger. Andrews and I walked up to the engine together. We passed a sentry near the middle boxcar. His gun was at tight shoulder shift. There were other soldiers farther down the track and plenty a little farther west. Some were cooking, some one thing or another. We found the engine empty, the engineer and fireman having gone to breakfast. Andrews told me to go back and pull a pin between the cars while he would walk up the track and see that the track was clear so we could pull out. We parted at the engine. I went back and pulled the pin between the third and fourth car and laid the pin carefully on the drawbar. Stepped out and walked leisurely back to the engine. The guard was walking his beat within 10 feet of where I pulled the pin. Andrew soon returned to the engine after checking the siding switch and said that it was all right. By this time, our party had gotten out and we were coming up alongside the train. One of the side doors of the box car being open, Andrews waved his hand for the men to get in and they scrambled into the car. Andrews told me to take the engine. I stepped upon the footboard and took my knife and cut the conductor's bell rope, which extended over the boxcar roofs and through the mail and passenger's car. I then released the tender brake before taking my place at the throttle. I noticed that the tender was about full. On a signal from Andrews, I pulled the throttle of the engine open. It seemed for a second that everything stood still. Suddenly, the morning calm was shattered with a violent huff of smoke. 
a hiss of steam, and the grinding of iron on iron. The general lurched forward with three boxcars trailing behind it. Private William Knight. The general soon passed a lone freight platform on the left known as Moon Station, where Jackson Bond's section gang was repairing a switch. We heard the general's whistle, which was 15 minutes early. We were mystified when the train drew up and dashed by. I didn't know anyone in the cab. Jackson Bond. Just beyond Moon's, the general pulled to a complete stop. With the agility and daring for which he was noted, John Scott climbed a pole and cut the telegraph wire so that by no possibility would the enemy be able to send a dispatch ahead of us. Scott made the wire ends fast to the rear of the car. The way we yanked down the telegraph poles and tore the wire loose when we started was frightful to behold. Private George Wilson. The general soon pulled forward and within minutes the raiders would enter Bartow County. Meanwhile, the unexpected departure of the general had created quite a commotion in Big Shanty. The general's conductor, William Fuller, set out on foot to recapture his train. Engineer Jeff Kane gave chase too. Anthony Murphy dispatched a rider to Marietta with instructions to notify the superintendent of the Western and Atlantic Railroad before running after Kane and Fuller. At Moon Station, the three borrowed a platform car and proceeded to kick and pull the vehicle in pursuit of the general. The chase was now on. Well, this is called Hugo, and Hugo was actually the first uh, landmark that existed on the Western and Atlantic Railroad uh, during the time of the Great Chase. And Hugo was simply a wood and watering stop that was just south of Alatoona, which is just on up the railroad track here. Now, we're on a, uh, a road that is now, uh, or was formerly the railroad bed, the Western Atlantic Railroad bed, and uh, has been paved, but it's been pretty much uh, forgotten. But this is where <clears throat> we could actually say the general made its first pass with a tangible site in Bartow County. And this is South Bartow County, about four miles north of Ackworth, um, just off of Sandtown Road on Altoona Pass Road, which ultimately empties right in front of the uh, unknown soldier's grave. Right. Did, uh, did the general stop here or slow down? No, it did not. It, it, at this time, it had plenty of wood and water, and it was uh, in, in uh, fast pursuit, or not pursuit, but chase, uh, headed north and did not stop at this point. It was actually trying to get on through this area to its first potential target, which was the uh, Etowah Station. Right. Now, these are, are these man locations? Are there people here? There, there usually is an attendant, was an attendant around the, um, uh, each watering station or wood station. And according to our records, all we could, could say that was here would be one or two perhaps farmhouses that uh, probably served the area here with the wooden watering station. Interesting. Were there a number of these wood stops throughout the county? Yes, including the official stops, such as the depots, in, as in Cartersville and Kingston. Um, the Western Atlantic Railroad was known to have a wood stop or a watering stop approximately every five or six miles because these wood-burning locomotives consumed an enormous amount of wood, and they didn't know, according to schedules and weathers and weather, that uh, they might have to stop and, and refuel at any time. All right, now how long had the general been, uh, or how long ago did it leave Big Shanty, would you say, before it hit this point? Uh, we're talking about the, the race beginning somewhere around 6 a.m. in the morning at Big Shanty, and of course they stopped for the breakfast at that point, and the, the general was hijacked or stolen, and it wouldn't have taken long for them to have reached here. There is one other recorded stop south of here at Moon Station in Cobb County, so I assume it would have been about 20 to 30 minutes by the time it reached here at most. At the next station, Alatoona, we met and passed a train. They evidently regarded us with suspicion, as the trainmen knew the locomotive we were on, but the hands were all strangers to them. We did not parlay or answer questions, nor stop. Private George Wilson. The engine pass was most likely the Kennesaw normally kept at Alatoona. 
Here, the Sandtown or Tennessee Road from the south and the old Alabama Road from the east joined here to cross the Alatoona Mountain Range. A man-made cut in the mountain range at this point accommodated the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Before entering the pass, a small community existed which boasted several homes and warehouses. Remaining today is the John Clayton House, which served as a hospital during the Battle of Alatoona on October 5, 1864. The old track bed was moved several hundred yards to the west around 1949 to accommodate the construction of Alatoona Lake. Within two miles, a train approached Stegall's station, since renamed Emerson, in 1889 to honor Civil War Governor Joseph Emerson Brown. The railroad reached this town in 1839 with the first depot being a boxcar. The first permanent depot wasn't built until the 1850s. Stegall's station was named after Emsley Stegall, who immigrated from South Carolina. He was a farmer by trade, but developed into a prominent landowner and established an iron furnace, which aided the Confederacy. The pre-Civil War home of J.P. Stegall still remains today as a silent witness to the chase. Mr. Stegall once served as postmaster for the town. The raiders did not stop here and proceeded on towards the Etowah River. Okay, uh, Guy, we are just south of the um, Etowah River Bridge on US 41, uh, just behind W.D. Fortenberry's property and home. This is the site of the original railroad bed uh, that has been since relocated in the 1940s. But about eight miles of the railroad bed of the Western Atlantic was considered to be the corkscrew route, uh, some of the most treacherous curves in the uh, Western Atlantic bed. And this is the site um, that is just about a mile before you get to the existing stone towers there at the river and we're standing next to what is considered to be a concrete signal base and we can't quite authenticate the exact year but it's probably late 19, uh, 1890s or early 1910 but this would have been a signal base that uh, was positioned right next to the railroad bed that had a uh, post and signal, uh, signal uh, um, markers to let the engineer know if the traffic up line was, was congested or if he needed to be cautious and slow down or what have you. Now, you'll notice the, the holes in this uh, signal base. Um, there is the possibility this, this was either chain driven with weights, counterweights, or it had electrical lines that uh, operated electrical light signals. We're not quite sure. But this was originally found next to the railroad bed here in this impression and last year uh, in January I believe it was uh, Don Fortenberry and I uh, and a couple of his relatives came out and we dug this out one Saturday it took us a couple of hours to do that and finally got his his Jeep Cherokee and pulled it on out so we could see what we had but it was literally covered with brush and dirt and we couldn't see exactly what we had but after getting it out we do think it was probably late 1800s or, or early 1910 Again, the railroad was um, uh, laid out by Stephen uh, Long. He was a colonel prior to the Civil War in the Union Army, and he's been criticized a good bit for the, for the way that he had to lay the railroad out. But since that time, no other engineer has really been able to prove that there was a better route. But in the 1940s, this eight-mile section was considered to be the most treacherous. They did come back in and find that with modern machinery and other means, it was better to move it to the west. So this property was originally the railroad bed, and you can see the richness of the soil because there's a lot of uh, cinders and uh, coal and wood ashes and so forth in here. And this property has since been sold off by the Western Atlantic State on Railroad to uh, private citizens, and Mr. Fortenberry is one who's bought some of this property here. We have a real good photograph taken in 1864 looking from the federal fort above the Etowah station looking back this way. It shows a real sweeping curve that I, I notice uh, Kurtz called a McGuire's curve. Right. Um, the, I think this would be the area that would be considered that location. 
And later in the uh, war effort, the uh, 19, 1864 time, there was considered to be a, a earthen fort here of the Confederate forces that would fire back across the river at Union forces. We were just talking about this area being on McGuire's Curve on the railroad track. Mr. Fortenberry, you know a little about that. Well, uh, all that I could remember when I was a ch just a small child, it was McGuire Crossing was uh, out on 294, uh, th this side of the landfill. And it's, uh, in those days, we didn't have crossings for uh, cross arms and signals for train for cars to go across the track, and people would get out and put their ear down on the track to feel the vibration before they crossed the track. They felt the vibration, they just waited until the train went by. But this uh, is the original railroad bed that we're That's standing right. on. That's and, exactly, and exactly right. Mr. Fortenberry, this goes around through your property, and you That's bought right. this originally from, how did you come by buying this? Uh, Thompson Ryman Company. Okay, and they probably bought it from the state, uh, the original uh, railroad right away? Probably so, I really don't know. Okay, but this run, winds around through your property and then on, on across the, uh, what is now US 41, mm -hmm. and, and then um, over into the tree line there, and it lines up with the four stone towers of the bridge piers yeah. that would have supported the wooden bridge at the time of the Great Chase. And on top of the knoll, just just across there, uh, was where the Union forces had their cannons. Right. And uh, to uh, stop the Confederate forces trains from coming across there. Right. And they lost. My understanding is they lost two of them down the hill and into the river. <laughs> and they they stayed there till uh, uh, I'm thinking uh, 1936. And they were uh, some salvage company from Atlanta came up and got them out and. I don't know where they are. Rounding a left-hand curve leading from this point, Raider Knight eased the engine onto a sturdy network of stone piers and wooden truss work, carrying the track over the Etowah River. We're on the south side of the Etowah River, just a little north of the Fortenberry property now, and just a little north of the Shaw Industries on the uh, east side of US 41. Now, these bridge piers represent the first target of opportunity that James Andrews and his raiders had. And as they raced northward uh, out of Alatoona and to this area, the um, surprise that Andrews had was not knowing that this area was also a spur that led to the Etowah community and rolling mill. Now you've done a good bit of research on that. And he was unaware that there was a, uh, a spur here and a turntable station. And <clears throat> he had not done his research properly and this is probably his first and perhaps his most fatal mistake because he was completely surprised that there was a little engine called the Yona, Y-O-N-A-H here, tender car with uh, about a dozen men who had uh, arrived in anticipation of the general on its regular route so that they could load some castings from Major Mark Cooper's furnace just upriver here. Andrews and his men were so taken and shocked by it that they had to make a snap decision to either run past it and take their chances or either stop and take on these men and perhaps disable the Yona and uh, rip some rails up and try to damage this area. Now what is important to know is this is the first bridge or target of opportunity that Andrews had to burn this bridge to do the first massive damage to the Western Atlantic Railroad line. Now he had to make this snap decision and his decision was to avoid early confrontation. This was not a popular decision with many of the Raiders. One in particular, Knight, uh, was not in favor of doing this. And they had some pretty harsh words, but ultimately Andrews prevailed and took command of the mission again at this point and said that this was really um, an in, insignificant uh, point and that they would go on north of here and not risk uh, uh, the mission at this, at this time. So they did go ahead and bypass this area, and they made a, a, an additional mistake here because he should have gone on up line about a half a mile or a mile and ripped a rail up to prevent pursuit by this engine, the Yona. 
It's also important to know from the pursuer's viewpoint, Fuller, Murphy, and Kane uh, were very aware of the schedule and they knew in pursuit northbound behind Andrews and they were on a push car, or excuse me, a pole car, mm -hmm. and they wanted to reach this area before the Yona returned to uh, the, the furnace area in, in Etowah. And they knew if they could get here in time, they could commandeer the Yona and then pursue the general in, in much faster terms using a, a steam locomotive themselves. Uh, back down uh, track here, there is a, an area uh, that's documented in many of the books that as Fuller and his people were approaching, they did see that the Yona was here waiting and they could see the plume of smoke coming out of the, the boiler and they knew that they, they could uh, reach this and do what they wanted, which was take command of the Yona. And they were so excited when they saw the Yona was still here that they had failed to realize that uh, the general and the, the raiders had stopped just down line from here and taken up a rail or two. And because they failed to see that, their pole car left the tracks and tumbled down the embankment and everyone was pretty seriously bruised but no bones were broken or what have you and they they remounted their pole car and came on into the area here and told major mark cooper's crew people what had happened and they did uh, commandeer the yona and pursue the general north from this point now did andrews had he been through here before the war Yes, he was supposedly a, a, a southern sympathizer and had many friends along the way, and he was trusted, and in, in many regards he was a double agent, and the South thought that he was more sympathetic to the southern cause, and he basically brought harmless contraband and information, as a matter of fact, bogus information back from the north and fed it into the southern lines, but in, indeed his heart did rest with the Union forces and the Union cause, and he, of course, was... Um, uh, in General Mitchell's, Ormsby Mitchell's uh, command at the time with the ultimate sabotage mission to destroy all of these railroad bridges that he could. Right, now the uh, spur track that you were talking about that goes from the Western Atlantic Line to the Etowah manufacturing uh, plants, uh, the operation, it was about four miles long and it was uh, completed, I believe, in 1858. So, so his knowledge was just not really up to date on this thing. That's correct. He had been south and he had basically given a, a survey uh, attention to the to the main line but this was a big surprise to him he was not aware of this community and he was not aware of this spur and certainly he was not aware of the schedule that there could possibly have been uh, a small train an engine waiting here and one of the things that he had did learn in, in trying to do his homework so to speak about the great locomotive uh, chase and preparation for that was that he learned in the south the confederates or the rebel railroad personnel would tie a red bandana or handkerchief or red piece of cloth on the rear of the last car. Uh, that signal to waiting passengers and other uh, personnel and, and stations that if the train bypassed and did not stop, that this was a train that was an irregular train that had been pressed into service and that the train they were expecting would be right behind or soon follow. And so he had somewhere in, in South Bartow County or just before he left uh, Cobb County ask one of the raiders to tie a red bandana or a piece of cloth on the last boxcar. And so all the uh, uh, stations and wood uh, watering spots that he passed, the personnel and the, the passengers and others that would see that thought, oh, well, this is the general. We expected it to stop, but it has been irregularly pressed into service, so we'll just wait for the next train that would pick up the regular schedule. So as he passed here, the uh, Major Mark Cooper's crew and others at the station saw that red bandana, and they weren't alarmed. Mm -hmm. Make note that the that the uh, station was up where about where that manu the uh, mining company building is now somewhere in that area. Metal building. Metal Hill, right. That is correct. And uh, they had a turntable, which I understand was just a little off, not quite before you get to the Western Atlantic track. That's, That's a turntable that was where the Yona was. The Yona was there, and so was the tender car and the the freight that it had pulled over. And um, it, the the. The Yona was pretty much headed in the right direction, and the tender car and, that, and the, the Yona had to be coupled very quickly. And this spot, they, they got about a half a dozen to a dozen volunteers to join them in pursuit. So when they took command of the Yona, the volunteers jumped up on top 
of the tender car and it wasn't burdened with several other cars to pull so it didn't have a load behind it and it was able to make a fast pursuit and records show that it actually made the pursuit between here and Kingston in less than 15 minutes which was record time for speeds of, of uh, steam powered locomotives at the time. Joe, we moved to the north end of the Etowah, overlooking the uh, piers. You mentioned this was the first really uh, strategic point. It was the first major bridge across a waterway. Why didn't he just blow it up or burn it? Well, I think that's a good question that, that probably is going to go down in history unanswered. Um, he had researched, uh, along with Ormsby Mitchell, uh, the concept of destroying the, the Rebel Railroad, and that uh, the, the basic thing that they thought they could do would be to destroy the bridges, to inflict the most damage. Now, many people have asked, why didn't he have some compatriots along the way that could have aided him as he reached certain points? And it is curious as to why he didn't have some tools, explosives, or flammables such as coal oil or other things that he could have used to accelerate a fire. And uh, he, he seemed to just basically depend on their ingenuity as they reached each target of opportunity. The uh, Etowah River Bridge was his first target of opportunity. Now, he wasn't going to reach the other targets of opportunity until he got up in uh, um, Dalton and basically the uh, Chickamauga area up around uh, uh, Ringgold and, and then there. There were 13 bridges up there that he could burn. But it is curious as to the fact that he didn't bring any flammables with him or have people that could meet him from time to time and, and help him destroy those bridges. Now, rain did start on that day. It started slowly and it became a drenching rain, so he had a, uh, an obstacle for Mother Nature to contend with. Um, as he reached some of these covered bridges, and at one time this bridge was covered and actually was a two-floor bridge, one for uh, rail traffic and one for wagon and pedestrian traffic. He tried to start the fires by taking a, a shovel that was in the firebox area and scoop cinders and, and hot coals out and put them on the trestles, but that wasn't very effective for uh, a fast fire, and it certainly wasn't effective during a wet day. Later in the chase, as he reached some of these other targets of opportunity, he, he and his men became more desperate, and they were trying to start a fire in the boxcars that they were uh, pulling. And he had three boxcars, and the idea uh, hit them that maybe they could start a good fire in a boxcar that was dry on the inside and leave the boxcar uncoupled inside a covered bridge and hopefully the bridge would inflame. But as the pursuers were able to close the distance, they were able to come up behind any boxcar that they had set afire and just push it on out. So what began as a mission of sabotage under the, the Union Raiders' control quickly became became a mission of desperate escape and they were having to forfeit many of their targets of opportunity. So we don't know why he didn't bring flammables or other tools with him. Or didn't have some contacts along the way to leave them at strategic points. Exactly. Uh, we're kind of standing here where about the turntable uh, would have been for the Yona, where the Yona would have been yes. at the time that the general passed through. Uh, I noticed that there's still some old tracks over it's here on the side, uh -huh. and uh, you can kind of still see kind of the lay of the land. As I understand it, the old uh, Etowah Station was a little off, uh, maybe 100 yards in the distance, right. around this bank, and I also understand this this whole bank had been covered, cut away at one time just to make room for this spur track going uh, to the uh, Etowah Ironworks. It's right in the turntable, and, and of course, as we've already discussed uh, later in the war, up on this hill, Knoll here, there was an earth fort for Union forces, but that was about two years later. But Andrews was fully surprised by the fact that the Yona was here with about 12 men ready to offload their uh, castings. And again, he and Knight argued pretty fiercely about what to do. And Andrews prevailed, and on up line, he should have stopped and taken up a rail to at least prevent chase by this threatening. 
Yona engine that was sitting here, but he considered it an insignificant uh, find and that it would not be a later threat, which ultimately, in my opinion, having researched this thoroughly, this was perhaps his most fatal mistake because the Yona was the engine that Fuller, Kane, and Murphy used because they were coming uh, northbound south of them on a push car, pole car, and they knew if they could get here before the Yona returned to Etowah Station, they could commandeer it and chase the general using steam power and close the distance. And that is exactly what happened. And they were able to close that distance of about 15 miles or so in, in less than 15 minutes and uh, arrived in Kingston just behind the general as it left. We safely passed the Great Bridge at Etowah Station and no stop was made. We glided on through Cartersville, a town of considerable size two miles from the river, where there were many disappointed passengers on the platform. Corporal William Pittenger. This platform was part of Cartersville's first permanent depot built in 1854. The old depot survived Union rifle fire and the Union torch in 1864. It was increased in size in 1902, however much of it was demolished in 1972. Today only a small 25 by 40 section of the original depot remains. The city of Cartersville was begun by a small group of settlers in the 1830s who took the suggestion of Colonel Farish Carter and named the town after him. Cartersville began to prosper and was incorporated in 1850. Fourteen years later, in 1864, the town was destroyed by invading Union forces with only two businesses and two residences left standing. Of these residences, only the Field Tumlin home remains. It was built by Elijah Murphy Field and his wife Cornelia in 1860. The old home served as a Union headquarters during the town's occupation in 1864. Located on Irwin Street, in sight of the railroad, this home stands as another silent witness to the great locomotive chase. A few miles above Cartersville, we stopped and began to wood up. Corporal William Pittenger. Two possible locations were in existence. However, confusion exists as to which location the general actually stopped to refuel. The first stop is Rogers Station, which no longer exists. The site can be located at the intersection of Iron Belt Road and the CSX Railroad, formerly the Western and Atlantic. This wood and water station was named after Robert L. Rogers, who came to Cass County from Spartanburg, South Carolina in 1848 and settled in the vicinity and engaged in mining and farming. His brothers, Tom and Minus Rogers, reared families nearby. The second possible stop other than Rogers Station for securing wood was Cass Station about a mile up the track. This is located just not really in downtown Castle, but, but outside, sort of southwest of downtown Castle. And this location was uh, very important in the Great Locomotive Chase. Uh, here in this vicinity, the original depot stood for Cass Station. As a matter of fact, we're probably standing on the location of what would have been the, the loading platform, the, the freight dock. What is behind us is a, a um, warehouse that did not exist during the time of the Great Chase. This was built uh, probably in the late 1800s or early 1900s after the Civil War. Now the depot itself was destroyed by fire in 1972 as I understand it and it was just in this location to our backs and then this warehouse was built later. I had a rather good conversation with the old station master here. And uh, as a matter of fact, they struck off such a good relationship that the station master handed uh, James Andrews the uh, train schedule activity, traffic schedule up and down the line. And that helped Andrews very much to know what the, the traffic would be north of here. Now, this is also important because uh, this was the first time that Andrews used his story about a powder train, uh, an irregular scheduled train that was pressed into service to run some uh, uh, emergency ammunition and supplies north to to ultimately to uh, General Beauregard in Corneth, Mississippi. And the old station master here, of course, was a very fine southern patriot, and he wanted to do anything he could to help the southern cause, and that's why he surrendered his uh, train schedule. And as I say, that was very valuable to Andrews in that day. 
he did use his story here to cover his sabotage mission, which was a, an emergency powder train. Mm -hmm. Now the old station here, this was a good size station, more like you would find in Cartersville or Daresville. It wasn't just a small little flag station. It was a, a large. Absolutely, it would be. And uh, if, you, if you read your history and study something about the Western Atlantic Railroad, the town of Cassville was located a distance from here, and there was some controversy about the railroad not going into Cassville. And of course, in those days, Cassville was quite a cultural center for Georgia. It was probably the, the, the largest city north of Atlanta. It had a college, a couple of colleges, and, and a thriving commerce here, but the railroad did not go into Cassville. So this station was very prominent. It served the Cassville community and, and the uh, surrounding area. But it, it was uh, very interesting to know that the, the community of Cassville and the people did not particularly want it to go in there because of the, the noise and the, uh, the smoke that it created. But there was another population that did want it to come in there, but ultimately it was located here and then, of course, on up track to uh, Kingston. About a mile farther up the track is the railroad sidetrack community of Conocene. The sidetracks were used during the Civil War, but little is known about this area located where the railroad intersects Hamilton Crossing Road. Only two concrete signal bases and sidetrack service space remain today to attest to this once important location on the Old Western and Atlantic. We reached Kingston about 8.30 a.m., a little ahead of time. A glance showed Andrews that the local freights we were to pass had not yet arrived. Stopping on the main track to the right of the station, we were for the moment almost directly alongside another passenger train, then lying on its own track behind the station, which joined the main line 300 yards ahead. This train from Rome, Georgia, was expecting the coming of the morning mail and, of course, the arrival of our partial train in place of the one they were expecting was a matter of great interest to them. Corporal William Pittenger. Kingston was named in honor of Judge John Pendleton King of Augusta, a noted lawyer, a U.S. senator, a Georgia senator, and a railroad pioneer in Georgia. Prior to the building of the railroad, the stagecoach route passed through this town, with the hotels and the spring there well patronized. A large stone depot existed at Kingston, which was later destroyed, as were many other buildings, by the departing Union Army, which had occupied the town from May to November 1864. Overlooking the western and Atlantic as the general entered Kingston was the Goulding House, named after the Reverend Francis Goulding, who bought this house in Kingston from Nathan Land in 1854. Although the Gouldings only lived there for five years, the house will forever be remembered for the boys' school there and the man who invented the sewing machine and was the author of many books. This house, too, remains another silent witness to the great chase. Also remaining and in sight of the railroad is the McCravey Johnson Jolly House, built about 1845. It is believed to have been built by Erastus V. Johnson, who served as a conductor on the railroad between Rome and Kingston until his appointment as general agent stationed at Kingston on the Western and Atlantic Railroad. This home is best known as the headquarters of Confederate General W.T. Wofford in 1865. Okay, here in Kingston, Andrews and the general arrived and found the station to be completely congested. They actually were delayed here for an hour and five minutes. This was unexpected to Andrews because he was a day behind his schedule. General Ormsby Mitchell with the Union forces were moving eastward out of Alabama, and they had not been delayed a day by the rain as Andrews had thought they would be. So what has occurred at this point was that Chattanooga was moving all train traffic south out of harm's way and harboring their traffic, their, their engines and, and uh, cars south of Chattanooga. And Kingston, as we know, is a major tie to Rome, Georgia. And uh, <clears throat> there was a good sized railroad yard here and a community of 12 to 1,500 people. So the hour and five minutes was ultimately very costly to the raid and one of the major reasons that it failed. Now, um, after the hour and five minutes, finally Andrews had to take matters into his own hands and when the last train arrived uh, that kept them blocked from going north, Andrews had to uh, actually take the switch keys from Eura Stevens and make the, the, uh, the, the switch himself so that the general could get back on the main line. And so they left 
uh, going north, and then they did stop and take up one additional rail to prevent anyone that might be pursuing them from the south. Now, as it happens, five minutes after they left uh, Kingston, the Yona arrived, bringing the pursuers, Fuller, Kane, and Murphy. They also found the station to be completely congested, and they had to abandon the Yona south of the station and make their way on foot north and had determined what had happened here by talking to the uh, station crew, and they found the William R. Smith from Rome, Georgia, to be headed in the right direction and full of steam, and so they took control of the William R. Smith and pursued the general just a short time behind the, the general's leaving. And of course they found the, um, the track, the rail of track that had been removed and they had to stop <clears throat> and then abandon the um, William R. Smith. Now Kane stayed with the William R. Smith and Fuller and Murphy continued the chase on foot. They did encounter the Texas coming south, the southbound freight as it was on schedule. They flagged it down told Pete Bracken, the engineer, what had happened, and Pete Bracken backed the Texas into a daresville, sidetracked his load, and they continued to the chase there in reverse. It must be noted that this was the second time that Andrews used his powder train story. Leaving Kingston, the general sped on towards Adairsville, stopping once to remove rails and to cut telegraph lines. Between one and two miles up the track, the ruins of two homes remain as additional silent witnesses to the chase. The first is Springbank, built by Charles Wallace Howard in the 1830s, which burned in 1974. This home is best known as the planning site for the surrender of Georgia's last 7,000 armed Confederate troops in 1865. Only the spring and its rock walls plus a fallen chimney remain today. The second site is the Oaks, built by Oliver Prince prior to 1845. The house is best known for the finishing school there between 1845 and 1863. This once fine home has been allowed to deteriorate and will soon be lost to time. About halfway to Adairsville, the general passed the wooden water stop called Hall's Station. Nothing remains of the old station today. Speculation exists that this was a large wood yard with a spring to supply water. Named after a Mr. Hall, little is known about the site or the person for which it was named. The station once existed in what is now an empty field on property off Hall Station Road, just north of the Barnsley Gardens turnoff. As we came inside of Adairsville, there to Andrew's satisfaction lay the southbound freight train which had been waiting for us. Nearing the station, our speed was slackened, and we pulled on to a sidetrack beside the freight. Andrews, at once, handled the usual storm of questions. Corporal William Pittenger. Adairsville was named after the Adairs, early Scotch settlers of the region, and was incorporated in 1854. During the building of the Western and Atlantic Railroad, Governor Towns had a large machine shop built on the site where the present town grew. Adairsville was exactly halfway between Atlanta and Chattanooga. Several fine homes on Main Street, which once parallel to the old Western and Atlantic, still remain today as more silent witnesses to the chase. What was once a two-room Indian log cabin was acquired by Dr. John W. Baldwin, who served in the Confederate Army. Another fine old home called the Oaks was built before 1850 and was first occupied by the Henry Veach family. Built before the Civil War, the old Thetford home backs up to the old Western and Atlantic Railroad. Last is the Isaac Brandel home on South Main Street, built prior to the war. We're north in Bartow County, and this is the location that uh, is the last one in Bartow County that can be associated with the Great Chase, tangibly uh, still here. Now behind us is the uh, Adairsville Depot. This was built in uh, 1848 uh, out of hand-hewn lumber, according to their history. Now, this sits on the, uh, what I would consider to be the east side of the railroad tracks, and the tracks are here to our right. Now, the significance of Adairsville and the de depot here is that when the uh, raiders and the general approached, they were southbound, I mean, they were south of the depot and northbound. 
uh, <clears throat> it was very important for them to make the Adair's Vault schedule. Now, if you'll remember, some time earlier we discussed in Cass Station that the old station master there uh, relinquished his track schedule. Mm -hmm. And that was very important to the Raiders because they then had the benefit of knowing what southbound traffic was ahead of them. And they, from that uh, schedule, they knew that there was a heavy southbound freight that they had to anticipate. And that train was to have been here in Adairsville waiting on them, uh, waiting on the general if it had been on its regular schedule. So they knew they had to get here in time to make that, that proper pass by or crossing. And Andrews was very determined to meet that schedule so they wouldn't have any other obstacles. Now, the general left Kingston, as we discussed earlier, and uh, made its schedule here to um, Adairsville. But before they arrived, they did stop and take up one other rail. Now, that played a major role uh, later as the pursuers, Fuller, Kane, and Murphy, pursued them from the south. But uh, Andrews and his men pulled into the station here and they had a moment to talk with Pete Bracken on board the Texas. Now Pete was the engineer and they needed to know what the northbound situation was and as far as traffic being run south as to whether or not it was safe or the tracks were clear. And they did take a moment and exchange some information here and Andrews tried to encourage Pete Bracken to go on south in hopes that, that, that his, his train itself would provide an ob obstacle for any uh, uh, pursuers that would be behind them. Now, at that moment, Pete wasn't really that interested in leaving right on the spur of the moment at his encouragement. So that prompted Andrews to use his story, his powder train story, for the third time in Bartow County, you see, and of course, this area being uh, good southern patriots, everyone standing uh, within earshot of that story then said, yes, let's, let's uh, get, get things back on schedule. And so Pete went ahead with his train, this Texas and southbound. Now, once he cleared the track, Andrews continued north with the, uh, the, the sabotage mission and about three or four miles from here, of course, left Bartow County. And then uh, the story continues, as, as we know, and then ultimately the raid uh, dies somewhere up around uh, Graysville, Georgia. Now, the uh, pursuers running north or, or south of here, uh, they did come upon the ripped up rail and had to abandon the William R. Smith. Now, Fuller and Murphy continue the chase on foot, and they hear the train whistle, as we hear now, and they realize that the... Um, uh, Texas is on schedule and so they flag it down and Pete Bracken being the engineer tells them what's happened here in Adairsville and they of course tell them what's happened uh, south of here and they back the Texas into Adairsville and they sidetrack the load his cars except for the tender car and they continue the chase using the Texas running in reverse The general left Adairsville and continued northward through Calhoun. At the Ustanala Bridge, south of Resaca, an attempt was made to burn the wooden covered bridge by setting a boxcar on fire. However, a roaring fire was impossible since all the wood they had was used as kindling and was soaked by rain. Continuing northward, the raiders removed rail, cut telegraph lines, and left obstructions on the tracks. For the pursuing Texas, the biggest obstacle was the long tunnel at Tunnel Hill. For the pursuers to be successful in catching the general, the tunnel had to be clear of all obstructions and the rails intact. When we came to the mouth, it was with no little relief that I beheld the upper surfaces of the rails as they reflected light along the entire course of the cavern. No dark objects were upon them. William Fuller. Finding the tunnel clear, I was satisfied they were short of wood, for if they had a furnace full of wood, smoke would have remained in the tunnel for some time, and we could not have seen the engine through the tunnel. P. 
Pete Bracken said, boys, we got him now. And pulling the throttle open with a full head of steam dashed through into the light beyond. Anthony Murphy. The Raiders had underestimated the relentless pursuit of William Fuller, Anthony Murphy, and others. When a lengthy fuel stop was needed most, the opportunity became impossible since the locomotive Texas could be seen in the distance. Andrews, Knight, Brown, and myself, who were in the engine, having given up all hopes of success, hastily discussed as the best thing to be done. Now certain that the southbound freight just ahead would cause unacceptable delay, with pursuers so close, believing that Chattanooga had probably been warned, Andrews figured the rugged terrain above Ringo would be as good as any to abandon the enterprise. It was concluded that the best course of action was to separate and scatter in all directions. The powerful machine had carried us safely for nearly 100 miles, some of the time at a rate of a speed appalling to contemplate. But she was becoming helpless and useless in our service. I would liken her condition to nothing else than the last struggles of a fateful horse whose heartless master had driven and lashed him until he was gasping for breath and literally dying in the harness. Our race was almost run. Private George Wilson. When the order was given by Andrews, every man for himself, the boys jumped down and lit out like a flock of quail. Private William Knight. The great locomotive chase had come to an end about two miles north of Ringgold, near Graysville, Georgia, with the general literally running out of fuel. Within two weeks, all of the raiders had been captured, including the two who had overslept and missed the chase entirely. Eight raiders, including Andrews, were hanged in Atlanta the following month. Not all the raiders were executed because court proceedings were interrupted by an advance of Union armies. On October 16, 1862, the 14 remaining raiders attempted an escape from Fulton County Jail in Atlanta. Eight succeeded in reaching the federal lines. The other six were recaptured. Fortunately, these same six were involved in a prisoner exchange with the Union Army on March 18, 1863. For the Raiders' service to the Union, the newly created Congressional Medal of Honor was presented to 18 of the 22 Raiders. This award could not be given to the two civilians, James Andrews and William Campbell. However, they were interred in the National Cemetery in Chattanooga with the other six executed Raiders. Following the chase, the Yona, owned by the Western and Atlantic Railroad, returned to its duties with the Etowah Iron Works. When the war was over, the engine was returned to the main station in Atlanta for use as a switch engine. Built in 1846, the Yona was named after the mountain in North Georgia. Unfortunately, the Yona was discarded for scrap when its service was no longer needed. After the war, the locomotive William R. Smith was presented to Samuel Noble in Anniston, Alabama for use at the Woodstock Iron Company. Later, Rome authorities sought to recover the Smith in order to publicly display it, but discovered it had been scrapped for metal during World War II. The locomotive Texas continued its work on the Western and Atlantic until early 1863. At that time, it was loaned to the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad for the purpose of hauling wood to Saltville, Virginia, for use as fuel in the refinement of salt, which was desperately needed for the people of Georgia. After the war, the Texas was returned to operation on the Western and Atlantic. The last known photo of the Texas under steam was taken near Emerson in 1903. Soon after, the Texas was retired from active service. Beginning in 1907, efforts began to save the old engine from the scrapyard. In 1911, the Texas was moved to Grant Park, where it is today on display in the Cyclorama Museum. Immediately following the great locomotive chase, the General was put back into service. As the Civil War raged closer to Atlanta, the General transported troops and munitions to the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain and evacuated the wounded from the battlefield. During the Battle of Atlanta, it assisted in the evacuation of the city, and it was there that the general was severely damaged during the burning of Atlanta. Afterwards, it was repaired by Union forces and put in operation for the United States Military Railroad until September 1865, when it was returned to the state of Georgia. The general continued its service until retirement in 1892. It has undergone extensive restoration since then, and has been the center of attention at numerous exhibitions and fairs. Bartow County's connection to the general did not stop with the great chase. 
On June 17, 1882, the general was involved in a spectacular crash in Kingston. The Atlanta Constitution reported that on a late night mail run, the general's engineer failed to notice an open switch and sailed through three boxcars killing the engineer. On April 14, 1962, the general made a centennial run celebrating the Andrews Raid. It stopped in Cartersville and other communities to mark the occasion. Proudly, Cartersville's own Mr. Jeff Moss, whose railroad career began in 1941, shared engineering honors with Mr. Paul West of Dalton. In 1972, railroad officials again asked Mr. Moss to transport the general from Atlanta to Kennesaw for enshrinement in the coveted Frey Cotton Gin. This trip gave Mr. Moss the distinction of being the last person to engineer the general. The gin is located next to the side of the old Lacey Hotel where the general stopped for breakfast just minutes prior to being stolen by the Raiders in 1862. The General's latest honor came when the United States Postal Service issued a commemorative postage stamp in honor of the General's place in railroad history. Let's join Mr. Jeff Moss as we visit the old converted cotton gin, now a museum and the home of the General. Well, I understand that you um, uh, actually ran the uh, locomotives when they were steam driven and you have um, you have to your credit of running through some of the old original railroad bed which would have taken us from uh, Ackworth through Hugo which uh, now has been relocated on through uh, well let's see you would have not run through Alatoona but you would have gone through Emerson and, and on into Cartersville and on up to Adairsville. I have in my hand uh, what I consider to be somewhat of an artifact we have uh, given to us for the program today by Mr. Moss his original orders on April 14, 1962 from the l &N Railroad that gave him authority to engineer the general on the reenactment uh, through Bartow County. Uh, Mr. Moss, could you tell us who was on the train that day? Who were you uh, pulling some of the celebrities that was on board the, the passenger cars? Do you remember who they were? Not necessarily. One man from Cartersville, still living, was president of George Marble Company, John Dent, he and his wife Charlotte. Uh, Governor Sanders? Yeah, Carl Sanders. He and his son was on there. They actually rode the engine from Elizabeth, that is May Rudder, who watered up there to Kennesaw. They got off here at Kennesaw and went to the coach. Uh, different towns, different people would ride. Finally, we got up to Ringo, and the kids took over. So how far did you actually engineer the train? About where halfway. Did, okay, where did, where did the trip start from? Atlanta. All right, what was the final destination? Chattanooga Union Depot. And how did you come to be one of the engineers or the engineer to be selected to run the train that day? I bid it in. You bid it. Now, what does that mean? It was seniority. Seniority. And how many the years? Oldest, the oldest seniority bid on it was the one that got to do it. Okay. Were you the only engineer that ran the train that day? Uh, Paul West. Now, who was Paul West? He was an engineer. He was from... Dalton, Georgia. Okay. And uh, I, I think I, I understand that <clears throat> on that particular day, as among the celebrities, uh, that Walt Disney was on board. Is that correct? Do you remember that? I do not know because I didn't go back there in the car. I see. Well, now, how fast would the general have been running uh, when, when it normally uh, would have been on routine schedule? We run it 40 miles an hour, except where we could slip in a little faster. <laughs> that was speed on 40 mile an hour. We're here in the 
museum in, in Big Shanty or Kennesaw, I understand that, that you were called upon again to uh, return the general here to be enshrined. Could you comment on that for us? I broke out of Atlanta. The mayor of Kennesaw, Mr. Fry, and one of the city councilmen rode on the engine from Atlanta to Kennesaw. They would not let me stop nowhere until I got here at Kennesaw, pulled down below the switch, and back to the side track and left it here to road cross. And you uh, have retained uh, for your files your. Um, I give that to you. Yes, sir. Uh, this is your invitation to yep. be a part of the uh, opening day here. This is the mayor and city council of the city of Kennesaw and the Big Shanty Historical Society request the honor of your presence at the opening dedication ceremonies of the Big Shanty Museum, home of the General. Uh, April 12th, 1972 at 2 p.m. To look at the general today, what are the most apparent changes that are different from the way it would have been when it ran the chase? Now, you mentioned earlier that the brakes didn't have any brakes. No air brakes. So those were added. Now, how'd you bring this thing to a stop? I had air brakes when I ran it. All right, but how would they do it back in 1860, during the years, 1860? Years of reverse lever. All right, so you just had Either to slow it down. Or okay, and put it in reverse. What else would have been different other? Well, the only thing I'd know would be you link and pin a couple of cars together. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a pin back yonder on the side. How many cars could this train pull? Well, according to how many, how much tonnage you was pulling. Back in them days, they was 30, I believe 30 ton to a car is all they'd carry. Now they carry 200. So no, you, you wouldn't see 100 a, ton. You wouldn't see a train with 100 cars on it. Oh, no, in those days. no. What'd be a, what would you say? Eight, eight or 10. Eight or 10. What began as a daring Union military objective to inflict severe damage on the Confederate railway supply line was foiled primarily in Bartow County and turned into a desperate escape struggle for the Union Raiders. Perhaps now the importance of Bartow County's role in the great locomotive chase can be fully appreciated and enjoyed by all who wish to know the rich history of this event. <laughs>